Oh, good morning. You probably know these verses. Um, you may have heard them before. From Matthew 28, Jesus came near to them and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Broadly known as the Great Commission, right? And it's what we broadly mean when we use the term make disciples here at Raymond Terrace Community Church. We simply try to do what Jesus not just suggested we do, not even just asked us, commanded us, right? But also here we use that term, make disciples, in um, a way to describe something of the bigger aim that we have as a church here. So maybe you're new here, maybe you've only, maybe you would say you're new-ish. If that's the case, well, have we got a deal for you? <laughs> All right. So every now and again, we have a new and new-ish lunch. So if you consider yourself new or new-ish, and you'd like to meet up with the leadership of this church, have a meal, have an opportunity to hear a bit about what makes us tick in our heart, if you'd love to be able to meet maybe some other new people in this church, um, please come and see Tim um, or myself or one of the pastoral team and we can give you the information. Or the easiest way is to go onto our website, use the connect menu item on our website. It'll open up a little form, online form. You can say, hey, this is my name. This is the best way to contact me. I'd love to come to the newish lunch and we'll get the detail to you. The other thing that you will read on our website if you go and visit it, um, or maybe you've heard it said if you've attended this service for a while here, you may have recalled us saying that our aim at Raymond Terrace Community Church, our aim is to make, mature and multiply disciples of Jesus Christ in Raymond Terrace and beyond. All right? Um, it's just a catchphrase, but it helps us try to capture some of the heart behind what we're about. Of course, if you've been here a while, you'll know that there are possibly a bunch of other things that our church engages with in the, in the general life of our church on a week-by-week -week basis. But our aim, our aim, not just within the pastoral team, but within our broader leadership, the ministries that are here, our aim is to connect and tie every single one of our activities back into the goal of those three categories, to make, mature, and multiply. And so... Um, Look, yeah, everything, everything about growing as a disciple, right? Whether you've come to know Jesus this week, if so, praise God, the angels are still having a party, yeah. all right? If you've come to know Jesus this week and you've said, I want to follow him, or maybe it was three decades ago, five decades ago, everything about your journey as a disciple of Jesus Christ can be described as being a follower of Jesus, right? Right? And so making disciples, that's, that's what we're about, broadly. But more specifically, I think this aim to make disciples really helps us focus on the very first two steps that we have in what we call our primary disciple-making pathway here at this church. How does a disciple become a disciple and grow as a disciple? And um, maybe that's the first time you've ever heard that term used. Maybe you've heard it a couple of times, but you're a bit unsure about what it means. So let me give you a snapshot for a moment. Um, the, the five steps that we have on the primary disciple-making pathway that we use as a church here, the first step is to connect. That's our first term, connect. Uh, if I was to describe that, we would say that we deliberately connect with our community to discover those who are seeking. There's a lot of people out there seeking. They don't know what they're looking for yet. Some of them are saying, I'm seeking God. 
A lot of them are just saying, I'm looking. I'm looking for something. They're seeking something. And we want to help you, not just help us as a program, but we want to help you connect with people in your street, in your school, in your workplace, or wherever it is that you live life. We want to help you connect with people in your community and discover those who are seeking. All right? That's the very first step, to connect. The next one is win. Connect, then win. That's where we present a clear gospel call and invite seekers to follow Jesus. Right? It's scary. I know when we use terms like evangelism and things like that, people start to twitch a little bit sometimes. They're like, oh, I don't know if I could ever do that. You know what it is? It's saying, hey, I'm, I'm a person who was lost and I discovered Jesus. Can I introduce you? At its heart, that's evangelism. It's helping one other lost person discover the, the one that found you. So maybe it's just your story, your story, your, your testimony, your, your, your way of saying, this is how I met Jesus and this is the way that he's made a difference in my life. That could be part of that. So connect, win, and then build is our third step. Build. It's where we purposefully invest in new Christians and establish the foundations of faith needed as a disciple of Jesus. Not only in the early stages of your walk as a disciple, but for your entire life. All right? That's build. And then we have two more, which are train and then equip. In train, we equip maturing disciples with the skills to multiply other growing disciples. We want to help you help other disciples to grow and help them to reach other people as well. And then lastly, multiply. It's where we send out new gospel initiatives to grow and multiply as well. And whether that's new ministries that are being birthed here, new churches that will reach our community in ways that we can't here, that may be the case as well. But we want to connect, win, build, train and multiply. Do you know that every single person in this room, every single person in this room can locate their journey in following Jesus somewhere on that disciple-making pathway. And kind of know what your next step is. Maybe you've sort of been thinking, man, I'm, I've been a, a disciple for a while. What's my next step? Well, we would love to chat with you about what that next step is. How can you continue to, to follow after Jesus? And so all, it, all, although every person can, right, locate themselves... Um, on this pathway, every person in this room could also probably think of somebody else in their life and maybe think about the relationship that you have with them and you might be able to say, you know what, maybe, maybe this is also the next step for them and you could maybe help them take that step in their life. Right? The, the pathway idea, I'd love to say that we, um, you know, we got patent pending on it. You know, we came up with it, but we didn't. Um, nor did we get it necessarily from some famous pastor's best-selling book. Um, it's a good idea, yes, but this idea of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's been, well, it's been around for thousands of years. It's been around for a long time. All right? we, we happen to think it's a good idea, and we happen to have chatted with other people to help sort of formulate and think through how we're going to do that here as a church, but it's around long before us, and in fact, it has its roots deep into the gospel story itself. Yeah. So our aim to make mature and multiply disciples of Jesus Christ in Raymond Terrace and beyond has its identity in the good news of Jesus Christ himself. Right? It is first and foremost formed by the gospel, and that's what we want to talk about this morning, the gospel. So let's pray. And why don't you pray that there's someone in this room, if there is someone in this room who has never yet heard the gospel in such a way that their heart softened and their knees would bend to say, Jesus, I want to follow you, then why don't you pray this morning that God would do that in their heart today? And if your heart has grown calluses on it, 
And you know it, that the good news of Jesus Christ has become something that you just sort of nod your head in assent to, but it has little other effect than, then let's pray that the Holy Spirit would rub some of those calluses away today. And that your heart would respond with softness to what Jesus has done for you. Will you pray? Lord Jesus, thank you for this good news that we are going to look at this morning. It is the most astoundingly good news this world has ever heard. We never want to become bored with it. We never want to speak about it like it's some incidental, second-rate thing. Lord, speak clearly to us today, we pray. To those who have never responded to the gospel, Lord, will you show them your love? Draw their hearts and their eyes to see you in a way they've never seen you before. And for those of us who maybe have hardened against the gospel in some way, Lord, will your grace cut through that and show us our need, even today, of a saviour. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So you can turn to that in your Bibles in our series through Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. And I'm not going to read the whole passage to you. We're going to look at from verses 1 through all the way through to 11 eventually. But I want to just read to you the first two verses for a moment. Um, The first two verses, and I want you to be thinking about sort of this phrase, which is the absolute necessity of the gospel. All right, the absolute necessity of the gospel. So read with me. I'm going to read from the Christian Standard Bible, just the first two verses. Paul says to the church in Corinth, and the Holy Spirit is saying to us today, now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you, which you received, on which you have taken your stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold to the message I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So there's a couple of things that I want you to take note of that, and they're just drawn from words that Paul uses in that text. The first is this. When we think about the absolute necessity of the gospel, the first thing that I want you to take note of is the fact that it must be clear. It must be clear. Paul says it, right? Right at the beginning of verse 1. Now, I want to make clear for you. The the reality is that the gospel isn't just some sort of vague, fluffy idea that we tack on to other things. So the gospel can certainly be used to describe something. It can be. The gospel isn't primarily an adjective, Some of you, it's been a long time since you've heard that term and you're starting to go, I'm associating that with grammar classes or something. Right, the gospel isn't primarily an adjective. It isn't used to describe something else, primarily. The the gospel is a tangible reality. Right, so it must be clear. The gospel must be clear. That's the first thing I want you to take note of. The second thing is this, the gospel must be spoken The gospel must be spoken. Before the gospel can affect anything else, right? Before maybe your life and ministry can be described as being um, gospel-centered, maybe. That's a bit of a catchphrase these days. Or maybe gospel-formed. My life is gospel-formed. Or gospel whatever. You, you, there's a whole bunch of different words that are being used these days on books and all sorts of things. Gospel focus, gospel centered. Or before it can be any of those things, before you can tell your friends even that you go to a truly gospel shaped church, before any of those things, the gospel must first be a message. Must first be a message. You've heard me say this before if you've been here a while. It's not a coffee cup verse, but sometimes it sounds like one. Preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. Have you heard that saying before? Yeah? So let me say this as clearly as I can. It's necessary. All right? To preach the gospel, you have to use words. I get what it's getting at. 
live a gospel life so that people can see the gospel in your life. You don't want to be two-faced about living one way and then turning up and saying, hey, you know what? Jesus loves you and he can change your life. And people go, really? I can't see that in you. Yeah. All right. So and I know what it's getting at. I'm, I'm not going to sort of split hairs over it. But here's the thing. Preach the gospel. If necessary, use words. It's necessary. You haven't preached the gospel until you told someone about the good news. All right? So I want to say it super clearly, it's necessary. There isn't a question about the necessity of speaking the good news. It must be proclaimed. Paul said it there. I want to make it clear to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you. And just in case you're sitting there thinking, going, Whew, I'm so glad that I'm not a preacher... That's Chris's job. That's somebody else's job. No way. That word preach, don't think pulpit. Think town crier. All right? Hear ye, hear ye. That type of thing. The person who turns up in the town square one day, and that town square might be your friend's living room. And you can say to them, hey, I've got good news. Let me tell you about it. Right? That's preaching, that's proclaiming, that's declaring, and that's the terminology that Paul's using here. Paul says, I want to make it clear to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel I preached to you. So let's use words, proclaim good news. It is absolutely necessary. All right. It needs to be clear, it needs to be spoken, and it must be received. It must be received. Paul says, this is the gospel that I preach to you, which you received. The gospel isn't a magical incantation. All right? You can't turn up with your gospel wand, say the magic words, sprinkle the gospel fairy dust and change the world around you. It doesn't work like that. It isn't an incantation, it isn't a series of um, magical spiritual words that can be uttered to fix things in your life or to fix things in other people's lives. The Bible doesn't offer a special combination of words like a gospel spell that if said or prayed will unlock heaven's gates. Instead, when the good news is heard... There are only two possible responses. You can either receive what is being said, or you can reject it. They're the two options. But it must be received. The gospel must be absorbed, received. More than received, it must be absorbed. Not just heard, not just nodding. Yes, yes, I believe that. Do you know what the scariest verses in the entire Bible is? For me, at least. The scariest verse in the Bible is James 2 and 19. Maybe you don't know it. Let me read it to you. James 2 and 19. James, he was a bit of a hard hitter, old James, wasn't he? I reckon he would have been a pretty abrasive friend to have in your life. They're one of those guys that always says things that makes you a bit uncomfortable. But they're true. Here's what James said. You believe that God is one? Good. Even the demons believe. And they shudder. All right, that's a terrifying verse. It's a terrifying verse. Not because it talks about demons, I don't care. Not because it talks about demons but because it describes countless masses of humanity who wear Christianity like a bumper sticker. He says, you know what? You believe in God? Big whoop! Demons believe in God. And when they believe in Him, it makes them shake. It makes them shudder. At least they have a right response to their belief. You can wear Christianity like a bumper sticker, but in fact, you can be driving headlong into hell at the same time. 
Right? That verse describes people who wear Jesus like some sort of costume to a fancy dress party. They just slip Jesus on when they want to look more like a Christian and then throw him back off again when the party's done. Now, the gospel is something that you stand on. The gospel is not something that you paint on when it suits your agenda. That's what Paul's trying to say here. The gospel is what you stand on even when your legs have been cut out from underneath you. Paul says, I preach the gospel to you. You received it and on which you have taken your stand. Everything is now centered on the reliability of this gospel message for the church in Corinth. And so the gospel, it does, it reforms people, it reshapes people, it remolds people. And afterwards, all is said and done, the thing that the gospel does is it remains. Paul says, you've taken your stand on it. You've more than just heard it. You've more than just said, oh yes, the gospel's a good idea. You've said, no, that gospel is my gospel. And it's going to change my life. I'm going to make my stand on the truth of this gospel. So those first two verses for me really paint a picture about the absolute necessity of the gospel. And we have to own that as a church. Here's the second thing that I want you to do in looking at this broader passage. And we're going to look from verses 3 down to verse 8. And this is really going to describe the non-negotiable centrality of the gospel, all right? It's absolutely necessary. That's the first thing. The second thing that I want you to look at is that there's, it's so central, and that centrality of the gospel is non-negotiable. So let's read the passage, hear what Paul has to say to us. Verse 3, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. The non-negotiable centrality of the gospel. Here's the first thing I want you to take note of that little tiny passage we just read. I've tried to title this as being the heart of the gospel and the gospel at the heart. All right, The heart of the gospel and the gospel at the heart. So we're 15 chapters into this letter in Paul's letter to Corinth. Um, The vast majority of this letter, if you've been on this journey with us all this year, you've known that the vast majority of this letter has been Paul trying to dismantle the false identities that we can form as Christians. And then, after dismantling them, he rebuilds that identity, but he rebuilds it in Christ. On the basis of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, this is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. All right, so this church in Corinth has had controversy. It has had favoritism. It's had elitism. They were turning a blind eye to sin. It's all been there and more, right? It's been pretty horrific. Someone's peeled back the layers and let us look into the intimate parts of the working of this church and it's not been a pretty picture. The church in Corinth was a mess, but here's the thing, it was a mess that Jesus loved. So what's the one thing that Paul needs to reduce everything back to in this church? No matter what it was that he was dealing with, some type of favoritism, elitism, you name it, it's all happening. What's the one thing that Paul says, I need to bring this all back to the most important thing? Or what would Paul say to us? 2,000 years or so after he wrote this letter, if Paul came in and peeled back the intimate layers of this church, are we much better? 
than the church in Corinth? I mean, in our heart, in this year, have we been sort of just going, yeah, look, I know things that can be a little bit rough here at times, but I'm glad we're not like Corinth. Have we got it all figured out yet? Have we cracked the successful church code? Can we confidently say that we are above the sins and failures of our brothers and sisters from another time and another place? We can't. So what does Paul need to say to us is the one most important thing that we need to grip onto. We all need to hold the gospel as being of first importance. I actually love that translation of that term, Christian Standard Bible. I passed on to you as most important. I, I don't mind that. Maybe your King James or your ESV or something like that might say of first importance. There's a bunch of important things that go in the life of a church. What's, what's the most important important? What's the first important? Well, Paul tells us. That there's a thousand other things that we can hold on to and legitimately think are good in the life of our church. There are. There are a thousand other things. But all those other things that we grasp, Paul's saying, we need to hold them with a loose grip and cling for all it's worth to the gospel. This church, this church, Raymond Terrace Community Church, must have a heart of the gospel. And in everything else that we do, it must have the gospel at its heart. All right, let me tell you, we will rise and fall as we hold firmly to the good news of Jesus Christ. We will. If we wander from that reality, the good news of Jesus Christ, then we wander at our own peril, right? So what's the backbone of the gospel? We, we've talked about it. You know, we've said, hey, this is so necessary, this gospel. And we've said it must be absolutely central. What's the backbone of the gospel? There's probably different ways that you can express the core message of the gospel. The gospel, in one sense, is the most simplest thing that a six-year-old out there right now can grasp it. And it's the most profound thing that you can spend the next 70 years exploring it and never get to the bottom. There are different ways that you can express the core message of the gospel. Even there are different tools that you can use to help communicate those truths. It's one of the things that we would like to do in this church more and better than we have in the past is equip you with some of those tools. How can you share the basic gospel story in a tool with somebody else, whether that's in your lounge room or a small group or something else? So there are different tools that you can use, but this is how Paul boils down this amazing and glorious story, and these are his irreducible truths. And he lists them here. Here's the first one. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. You see that? Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. It's in verse 3. It may seem strange that the good news... That's what gospel means, by the way, if you didn't know that before. The word gospel, it's um, a word that's been joined together from two other words. It means good news. Good news. It seems strange then that the good news begins with death. Right? Paul says this is the most glorious and amazing good news. Christ died. Seems strange to start with that. But remember, this death is no ordinary death. The one who died, he was a man in all the fullness of what man was created to be. In fact, so spectacular was this death that from that day till now, we call the Friday that he died good. 
Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. In fact, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. According to Moses' law, everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The death of Jesus was so necessary so that we could understand and experience what it means to have sin forgiven. Without it, there would be no forgiveness of sins. If I could give you a four-word sentence that could completely alter your eternal destiny, it's this. Christ died for you. Jesus died for you. That's where the good news begins. That's where the good news begins. But it's not where the whole story begins. The good news part of the story begins there. Jesus died for you. But the whole story begins with our sin. Our, if, you, if sin's too much of a trigger word, or it's just too religious in your thinking, here's another way of saying. It starts with our sin, which means it starts with our rebellion against God. The gospel is good news precisely because the story of our rebellion is so bad, right? We were absolutely lost in that rebellion. We had no hope in that rebellion. And all our best efforts of any sort of self-redemption fell far short of what was required for a good rescue. We were in a pit that we couldn't get out of, no matter how good you think you could climb. But from before the foundations of the world, before, before Jesus even uttered, let there be light, another story had been written. God had begun to write a better story than the story that we would try to write for ourselves. Right? In this story, God's hero was a lion that would be slain like a lamb. So Jesus came and Jesus died according to Scripture, according to the story that God had written before the beginning of time. Everything that God ordained, that God knew, that God could see, that God brought for his people, Jesus died according to that story, according to God's purposes. And he died so that there would be forgiveness of sin. That's what Paul says is the first irreducible truth about this story of the gospel. The second one that Paul raises, I passed on to you as most important what I also received, verse 3, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, verse 4, that he was buried. He was buried. Just as night follows day, burial follows death. And I know that there are people in this room who have felt that sharp stab of grief that death brings. Someone that you know, someone that you love. Right? And I've, I've seen the tears and I've heard the pain of the grief of those in this church and it's been like, some have even said, it's been like a knife to the chest. But isn't it also true that those same grieving people, when they've had to stand beside the grave as the fresh dirt was dropped onto a casket, that that knife twists in the chest, doesn't it? It's painful. It hurts. I think this is a sad picture of grief that we find in the Bible in Mark chapter 15 verse 46 just after the death of Jesus it says after he bought some linen cloth Joseph took him down that's Jesus took him down from the cross and wrapped him in the linen 
What an incredibly grief-stricken moment that must have been. These ones who loved Jesus, that he was a friend to. And not only just a friend, but a friend that they had hopes in, that somehow Jesus was going to change their world, and they've just seen him murdered. And that final moment of death that makes it all so tangible was Joseph kneeling beside a limp body, trying to roll it up and wrap it in a linen cloth. Right? This is the Jesus, right, that could just walk on water. This is the Jesus when people said, we're going to kill you, he just walked amongst them and just slipped away from the cliff that they were going to push him off. And here he is, he's limp and dead. And Joseph's trying to wrap him up in a linen cloth. And then it says, and then he laid him in a tomb, cut out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb, that finality of the burial. Separated now from the land of the living and now he's in the land of the dead. Jesus was buried. When Paul wrote a letter to the church in Rome, this is what he said to them. Therefore, in chapter 6, verse 4, therefore we, we were buried with him. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, spoiler alert, right? Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Jesus died according to the scriptures and he was buried, but that's not where it ends either. Right? The next thing that Paul says in verse 3, 1 Corinthians 15, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. This was always part of God's plan. So as we continue to move through Paul's letters, we're going to have a little break over the next couple of weeks from 1 Corinthians again, and then we're going to jump back into it and push through to the end of the year. We're going to see that Paul changes again his, his approach to this letter, and it's going to become all about what the, the resurrected life of Jesus looks like in the follower of Jesus. And here's where he begins to introduce it. Jesus was raised on the third day, according to the Scriptures. The grave is empty. The grave's empty. Right? For all of Joseph's grief in the wrapping up of linen, the rolling of the stone, the grave is empty. And here's Paul's theological point about that. The grave is empty so that my faith wouldn't be. The grave is empty so that I would have a living hope. If the grave still held Jesus, if the grave still held Jesus, then what happened at the cross was powerless. And our faith would have been in vain. Right? But the grave is empty. It is. Right? The cross can be called beautiful, and your faith overflows with a living hope, all because Jesus is alive. Colossians 2 and 15 says that Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly, and the Father triumphed over them in him. And so now, instead of fearing death and fearing the grave, if you are a follower of Jesus, you can mock the grave. Paul says it, in fact, he says it just a little bit later in this chapter that we're looking at in 1 Corinthians 15, where death is your victory. Where death is your sting? And the answer is, it's gone. It's gone. Why? 
Well, again, in that letter that he wrote to the Roman church, in chapter 4 and verse 25, Paul says, Jesus was delivered up for our trans- trespasses, but he was raised for our justification. He was delivered up for our trespass, our sin put him on the cross, but being made right with God involved Jesus defeating death. Or Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, for if while we were enemies, while we were rebellious against God, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life? You have a hope and an eternity because Jesus isn't in the grave. That's not the end of the gospel story either. As we go back to 1 Corinthians 15 and continue reading verses 3 and verse 4, he died according to the scriptures, he was buried, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, verse 5, and he appeared. And then there's a big long list of people that he appeared to. So I'm just going to say he appeared to many. He appeared to many. Now, because the resurrection is so important to our faith, it's also important to ensure that it wasn't more than just some sort of whispered rumour. If there had been a public trial held just one month, just one month after the death of Jesus, so if there had been a public trial to decide whether or not the resurrection was a reality, just one month after the death of Jesus, there would have been a line of more than 500 people who were waiting to get into the dock and every single one of them would say the same thing. I've seen him. I've seen him. A um, famous writer, now who sees Jesus face to face, A.W. Tozer, said the resurrection of Christ and the fact of the empty tomb are not part of the world's complex and continuing mythologies. This is not a Santa Claus tale. It is history and it is reality. Even Paul himself, he says, like one untimely born came face to face with Jesus. He was a rebel, right? A rebel knocked onto his backside off a donkey. Maybe that's what we all need. And it was who? It was Jesus standing face to face with him. And Paul knew it. He'd he'd just spent his entire life dedicated to destroying Jesus, destroying the church, destroying the name of the gospel. And he looked and he knew it was Jesus. And so Paul says, like one untimely born, I came face to face with him also. We're untimely born in that sense born thousands of years after Jesus walked this earth, but I can guarantee it, there's a whole bunch of people in this room who've come face to face with him. And one day, our faith will turn to sight. Martin Luther once said, though, our Lord has written the promise of the resurrection, not in books alone, but in every leaf in the springtime. We see the evidence of new life and resurrection, even in nature. So here's the humbling dignity of the gospel, and we're going to finish with this. Let's read verses 9, just down to verse 11. Paul says, For I'm the least of the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, so we proclaim and so you believe. This is just a single point that I want to make as we finish. The gospel, what we've just been talking about, 
Not some vague concept, but an absolute reality. Christ died according to the Scriptures, was buried, rose again according to the Scriptures, appeared to many. That story, those irreducible truths, that message of God's salvation, it humbles us. It humbles us. Why? Because it tells us that we are a sinner unable to save ourselves. It humbles us. But at the same time as it humbles us, guess what else it does? It dignifies us. It lifts us up. It tells us of a saviour who makes sinners into saints. He makes rebels into brothers and sisters. The good news, the gospel, is that we don't deserve Jesus, but we get him anyway. Right? More than that, the gospel is not God condescending to the groveling masses of humanity like some ancient mythology. Oh, they've bothered me long enough. I might as well do something to help them. That's not the story of the gospel. The story of a gospel is about a God who eagerly pours out his favour, lavishes grace in abundance and gives himself to his people. That's the story of the gospel. It humbles us, but it also dignifies us. Grace is at the heart of the gospel. Grace is. Paul says, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. I persecuted the church and maybe you're sitting here thinking, I'm not worthy of salvation. You don't know what I've done, Chris. You don't know the sort of darkness that's in my heart. You don't know the sort of tendencies that my mind will go to. You don't know, Chris. You're right, I don't. And God does, and that's the point. And he still says, I love you. And I want you, and I can redeem you, and it's all been done for you. It humbles us. We don't deserve it. But as Paul continues on, yeah, I'm not worthy. But by the grace of God, I am what I am today. Amen. And that's the same for anyone in this room who knows Jesus already. You've known salvation. You've met Jesus. And yet, let's be honest, darkness still lurks around the edges, doesn't it? Sin still crouches at the door. But by the grace of God, you are who you are. Not because you deserved it. Not because you've dealt with the darkness. Not because you've overcome. No, it's by the grace of God that you are who you are. It's because Jesus died for sinners and rescues rebels that you are who you are. And I am who I am. Grace is at the heart of the gospel. I love this, one of my favourite passages of the Bible. This is how we want to finish. I'd rather finish with God's word than mine. So let's stand, if you are able to stand, and open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to read together nine verses. Ephesians chapter 2, starting from verse 1. If you're able to stand with me, then I invite you to. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as the others were also. But God. But God. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, 
made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in our trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. While you're standing, maybe you reflect on your life right now and you think, you know what, I've been boasting in the fact that I've been good enough. That boast has just been thrown down. Maybe you're thinking, there's no way that I'm good enough. Maybe it's not a boast that you have, maybe it's a shame that you have. That shame has been thrown down too. Because you didn't deserve it, and you never will, but God has grace on offer, and it's in Christ. That's the gospel story. Maybe you've never experienced that grace. Maybe you're saying, Chris, I want to know about that grace. Then today is the day. Don't leave today without discovering grace. One of the pastoral team will be happy to pray with you. A friend that you came to church with would be happy to pray with you and introduce you to the God of grace and introduce you to Jesus. And you can begin your journey. So I'm going to stay at the front here. I think we're going to have a song. Reuben, we're we going to have a song. While that song's happening, I would love it. You don't need to come and even stand with me or do anything else, but I would like you to come up and just sit on these front chairs here if you would like to talk to someone. I'd be happy to. Somebody else will come forward and sit with you. We can talk, read, pray together. We'd love to introduce you to Jesus. Maybe you've walked with him for a while. Can I encourage you? If for some reason the gospel has become an ancient story of something in the past then ask Jesus right now, Jesus, can you give me arms to hold on to that gospel? Can you give me strength to grasp it to it? It's the most first important thing in my life. And then together, we celebrate in the gospel. We go out with the gospel. We make it clear for those who don't know it yet. Let's be a church who just simply loves the gospel. Lord, help us, we pray. We've got hearts that grow heavy and hard, ears that grow thick and dim. So refresh us, Lord. Give us a heart and ears to hear the good news of grace found in Jesus Christ. There's someone here right now wavering on the edge of just thinking, I don't know if I should. Lord, just hug them draw them to yourself, give them courage to walk forward and discover who Jesus is and will be in their life. In your name and for your glory we pray. Amen.